slow. Uh, I'm going to talk about the power of perseverance to transform your life. Many people are blessed because they start their life on the ground. I was not one of the fortunate ones to begin my life journey on the ground. Rather, I had to dig myself up from a very dark pit. There is an underground world where life is extremely difficult, it is excruciatingly painful, and in fact, it is quite treacherous. In this underground world, life is dark. There are no lights and there are lots of pathholes that you could easily fall in. And the worst, there are lots of systematic, structural barriers that could keep you down there. Whether you can make it to the ground or not will entirely depend on your perseverance. And perseverance is the product of five crucial principles. First, how do you see yourself? A victim or survivor? Second, do you have a vision in life? Third, are you ready to give the ultimate sacrifice? Fourth, are you being principled in the face of difficulties? And fifth, are you ready for hard work? My life is not entirely different from what most people have encountered here. I've been a refugee four times, with three of them before the age of 11. I come from a lower-income family that struggles to make ends meet. My father was a teacher whose salary was insufficient to support us, so he, he, he farmed. My mom was a housewife as well. My hometown, Halabja, was one of the most economic and socially depressed places in Kurdistan because of Iraq's genocide campaign, the UN, uh, the UN sanctions, and the Kurdish civil war of 1990s. So opportunities were really almost non-existent. And even if there were, the bleak and the fatalistic atmosphere of a cast in Halabja had made even a fraction of light seem far away, and Mirage was more tangible than hope. In 1995, I began teaching myself English. It was not like now, where you could access Google Translate and download multiple dictionaries on your smartphone. I had no dictionary. So I borrowed the dictionary from a friend for some time. I mean, I did not have even a few cents or a few dinars, for example, to photocopy several pages of the dictionary. So I had to use my terrible handwriting to copy hundreds of English words on paper so that I would memorize them later. My family and I could not afford to purchase a dictionary until December of 1998. In fact, that's a dictionary I got in uh, December of 1998. And these are the English words that I've kept. It. And even at some point, I was a migrant worker in Iran. I was picking an apple uh, near Tehran. I remember before I departed Halabja, I copied hundreds of English words on a paper, placed them in my pocket, and took them across the border. Every evening after coming back from more than 10 hours of picking apples, I was studying and learning the English words. In 2000, I graduated from high school with an average of nearly 80, and I got 96 English, which was very, very rare, in fact, especially in Halabja. I wanted to major in English. In fact, I had prepared my whole life for that eventuality. But I was not admitted into university because of patronage, nepotism, and chronism. At the same time, some of my peers were sitting in the same classroom, graduated from the same high school, with an average of 50, ended up studying in law and English departments in universities in Kurdistan region. Political affiliation, and university admissions came hand in hand. And that was really not the end of my misfortunes. I was staying in a public dorm when I moved to Sleimani to do my two-year community college. 
If you remember, every higher educational institution used to have elections, elections to elect student representatives. Again, the recommendation of the ruling political party, I did not vote. I put my ballot blank in the box. And that had, they found out about it, and that has serious consequence for me. They forced me out of the dorm. At that time, public dorms were controlled by political parties. I remember in the search of finding a new place, I went to all these public dorms from right to left, from Islamist to communist, to give me a place. They did not give me. Because of one reason, I was independent. And I'm still independent, very proudly. After graduation, I took a job as an English teacher in a very, very remote village on the Iranian border. The village was between two mountains. It was very cold and very snowy. The, I remember I took my dictionary and also radio with me to the village. The village was really so far away that only BBC World Service was available to listen to. It snowed, and also I remember I made, you know, snowbirds. I love to make snowbirds when it snows on the roof of the mountain, or of, the, of the school. The people of the village came to me and said, you have to destroy that, that bear. So I had to comply with the, with the order from the villagers to avoid being fed to the real birds that were in the mountains. In fact, there were bears at that time. I really did not think that I belonged there, to, to that village. One day, a government uh, truck loaded with construction materials came to the village. I asked the driver if I, if I could join him to come back to the city, to Slemani. He said, I would love to have a company. I quit my job without any hesitation. I came back to the city. My family found out that, you know, I, I left my job. They were very unhappy, and they sent me many warnings reminded me of the terrible future that was waiting for me. In fact, they came and tried to hunt me down, put me in a car and send me back to the village. You know, of course, out of love, because they believe that a government job is an insurance policy for my future. This was probably the most difficult period of my life. Uh, I had run out of the little money I had when I was in Suleimania. I wanted to come back to Halabja, but there was one problem. I had no money to pay for the bus transportation to come back to Halabja. But something was about to change my life forever. I met someone in Suleimania, in downtown, on November 3rd. That should be 2002. I don't know why it's 2022, by the way. 2002. He told me that many journalists were pouring to Suleimania Palace Hotel and they need translator because of the uh, potentiality of the Iraq war. I walked down to the hotel, I entered and sat in the village in the, in the, uh, in the lobby. I was introduced to a tall British guy whose name was Luke Harding. This is me and, and Luke uh, here. Luke told me, let's have a child, and if your English was good, I, I'm going to hire you. I told him that I have not spoken English in my whole life. All I have done was to memorize English words, read English, and also listen to the BBC World Service. He did not believe me, but he hired me immediately and told me that my salary would be $2,000, and then it was raised to $3,000. At that time, an average monthly house com household income in Kurdistan was probably about $200. I really did not think I was living in reality. I thought it was a dream. Just moments ago, I did not have even a few dinars to come back to Halabda to pay for the bus fare, and here I am being offered $2,000 to translate. So here I want you to keep in mind, although being poor is unpleasant and frustrating, Sometimes, the lack of financial means could be the key to open the doors of opportunity for you. After the marrying, marrying the love of my life, who happens to be a real lantern, lighting up my path, I got an email. You know that email, that text, that call that could open the whole world for you? The email said, congratulations. It was a scholarship from the Iraqi Leaders and Scholars Program, funded by Mobile. 
only seven students across Iraq were admitted to the program, and I was one of them. In fact, I was the only Kurd in 2007. Naturally, there were lots of familial, social, and cultural pressure on me to reject the scholarship. With a wife and a baby on the way, it seemed like a decision out of place. But I left my family, of course, with my wife's approval. I went to the United States to do my bachelor's in the University of Texas in Austin. I worked through some course and finished the entire degree a year earlier. I came home victoriously and happily, but I was not still satisfied. I applied for various scholarships across four different continents, and I got into four different master programs. I chose the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy to do my master's. In pursuit of further education, I wanted to do a doctoral degree. You see, when someone deprives you of your right to education, you value educational opportunities more. You really became even more hungry. After many failed admissions and applications, I started my PhD journey in 2016. Simultaneously, I had two jobs in two different towns. For four years, my schedule was really like this. Wake up four in the morning, take a shower, be in Washington, D.C. after 40 minutes drive, sit in a cafe, do other doctoral work and writing, exercise, start the, the first job in the Arab Gulf Institute in Washington, the best you know, place I've ever worked at, and then finish the first job, start another 45 minutes, to do the second job until almost 10 p.m. That was my schedule. I had no break. I had no days off for the entire year, for the entire time. So born and raised in genocide torn Halabja, going from being denied university entrance to do my master's, my, my bachelor's, my master's and doctoral degree in the United States, going from being destitute in my early 20s to purchase almost a half million dollar house in Virginia, going from picking apple in Tehran to be the first Kurdish reporter at the White House was quite beyond a dream. So please be persistent. Do not give up in the face of a failure two or 10 times. Don't be discouraged. I have encountered many failures and losses in my life, but I never allowed myself to believe that the war was over. Every failure could be a solid foundational rock to build your future on. So my advice for you, especially the youth, get out of victimhood mode. That's me actually, me and my family when I finished my doctoral degree. Get out of victimhood mode. To move forward, you need to see yourself as a survivor. Many of us see ourselves as victims, victims of bad government poor governors, unjust systems, brutal regimes, toxic culture, and even bad parenting. There are many things in life to blame if you want to stay where you are. Injustice should not break you, it must build you. Have a vision. It provides you with a clear picture of your future. It's a roadmap towards your destination, your ambitions. It will help you to stay on track even if you fall right and left. The reason I am where I am today is because I had a vision. I knew exactly where I was and where I was going, and I still know where I'm going. Ultimate sacrifice is required for life transformation. It could be sacrificing your time with friends, your sleep, and even separation from your loved one. I still get about 5.5 hours of sleep on average every night. Be principled. I have seen the power of principle to cut through all barriers during my life journey. Don't bend your values and beliefs for short-term interest and convenience because that will bring self-doubt. And self-doubt is the most destructive force inside you because it stops your progress. I still believe if I had only cast that vote in my early 20s, my life would have taken a completely different route.
and finally, make hard work the most significant part of your life value. Get up early in the morning, establish a daily routine to invest your time and energy wisely. It was through hard work that I was able to establish myself financially and get all my degrees from world's best universities. With these five principles, I was able to transform my life to better. If you decided to follow them, make sure it's comprehensive and touches every aspect of your life, including your mental, intellectual, financial, and even your physical well-being. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.